Now Tall Swan is one of the best known names in the sailing world. Famous for its high quality blue water performance cruisers, the company also has a very long tradition with racing. But if racing machines have become more complex and extreme, it's become harder to stay in front in this fast moving part of the sport. Plenty have tried, but not that many have succeeded. Swan's big break came when the Swan 65 Sayula won the first ever Whitbread Round the World race in 1974. That's a long time ago, but the company hasn't just remained in the racing scene since then, it's often led the way. One of their best examples has been to build and maintain a series of one designs, and here in Valencia at their one design world championships, it's easy to see why. 34 boats, 13 nationalities across three classes. The 42 was one of the first for Swan, born out of a project to supply the New York Yacht Club with a one design. It did a great deal to reinforce Swan's long-term goal to create a thriving one design scene. The latest is the Radical Swan 36. Here it would have been easy to play things safe and create a modest cruiser racer with a broad appeal. But Swan wanted to be bold. This was nothing like anything the company had ever produced before. But the class that's caught my eye here in Valencia is actually the Swan 50, because this is a class that since its launch in 2016 has defied the odds and created the biggest fleet of one design 50 footers in the world ever. No one else has been able to do this. And when you see the level of racing among the 16 boat fleet here in Valencia, it starts to become easier to see why. The boats are identical. There are strict cost controls. This, like all the Swan One Design classes, is an owner-driver class with a restriction on the number of professional sailors. But perhaps most telling of all is that the class has created its own sense of community, where owners have got together and organised their own social events and dinners. Sometimes success is about more than carbon fibre and coaching programmes. Swan have always done a fantastic job of attracting owners into the circuit and owners into their boats. And, and f there's a couple of reasons for that. I mean, the first one is the organisation and the circuit and the social format that they put behind uh, the racing. So it's a one design circuit, so the owners like that. So it's not an, it's not an arms race in terms of the finance. Uh, and uh, and the, the, being all the same, it's ultra competitive. Uh, the, the other uh, thing that's super important here in this 150 fleet is it's owner driven. Right? So, so the owners who are spending the money get to come and drive the boats themselves and it's a very strict owner-driver rule. So uh, the, the one design class rules are, are very tightly controlled and therefore the owners like that because effectively they, they play on a level playing field. And as I say, they're spending their own money, they're driving their own boats and that's a massive attraction. You're allowed a certain number of professionals on board. How many are allowed? Uh, so we're allowed five. Uh, the total crew's 12. So we're allowed five pros out of the 12 sailors. So again, the costs are controlled. Uh, we, need to sail with, uh, we need to sail with seven Group 1 sailors on the boat. And, uh, and just the balance between that, that Group 3 professional, Group 1 amateur uh, status and the balance of the, the, the exceptional world-class sailors on the boats, you know, alongside the, the Group 1 uh, amateurs, you know, makes it what it is. A uh, number of new sails within the uh, within the boat and within the season is controlled. Uh, again, you know, it's part of the very tight class rules. It's part of keeping a handle on the on the on the, on the costs of running the boat. Yeah. So the sail inventory, uh, we're only allowed uh, five new sails uh, per season, right? And we have to do a number of events in order to get those individual sail cards. So uh, uh, the the details as it stands right now is we're allowed two sa two new sails at the beginning of the season and then an additional sail after each event we do. So if we do, if we do three events or more, then we get the five sail cards. If we were only to do two events, we only get four. Uh, yeah, so you know, again, that's another good way that the class are trying to keep the cost down uh, as much as they can, all right? And, uh, and yeah, get more people into the sport and more people sailing Swan 50s. So given the size of the fleets and the level of competition within them, it's crystal clear that the one design scene has been a big success for Nautilus Swan. And when you ask where the idea came from and where the concept started, 
Everybody points to one man, Leonardo Ferragamo. I, I think the vision was uh, to really develop uh, one design, uh, bring it at a different level, where boats could be also being able to be cruised, maybe day cruising sometime or longer cruising, but there could be also um, one design, so allowing a, a different kind of competition. So something we believed a lot, and um, uh, one design brings to the world of racing uh, so many rational elements. It uh, highlights the human factor. It uh, um, creates a rational in the management of the boats uh, and it creates uh, the adrenaline of being uh, neck to neck uh, with your competitors. Uh, and so uh, it was missing in a bigger size of boats uh, and so that is what we felt of doing. And uh, yes, we're very proud and uh, we want to continue developing this uh, world uh, because uh, we believe that the world of sailing can really appreciate it uh, more and more. In the Club Swan 50 class, the one that in fact you, you race in, you've got 16 boats here. I mean that must be the biggest 50 foot one design class in the world. What's, the, what's been the secret to that success? I think the reason that I was saying, um, uh, obviously the fact that there is uh, the Swan brand and company behind them uh, um, makes a big difference. Uh, I'm saying this uh, with, uh, with, uh, uh, with a lot of pride uh, because we are about reliability, we are about uh, uh, creating boats that always have an essence of uh, a swan and even if it is uh, separate of the swan line, Club Swan, uh, it does have that the DNA which is about elegance, it is about performance, uh, elements of innovation and always uh, reliability. So the fact that we came out with these uh, boats, uh, I think with the, these elements uh, uh, that we were granting, uh, definitely made uh, uh, a difference. At the other end of the scale, you've got the radical Club Swan 36, which I, I think some people might say yeah. hasn't, had the, hasn't had the limelight that it, because of the pandemic. It came out just before there, but it's been very successful, but it's so different to the 50. It, it is. Uh, and, um, um, that is a part of the Club Swan philosophy, where we can do with other, uh, with a different brand name, uh, projects that are different from a typical Swan. The same as we have done the 125, which uh, is a, uh, one of its one of a kind. Uh, we have just launched the Club Swan 80, which is another lovely, very fast project. So, within Club Swan, we want to go to different project, uh, um, and uh, the. Uh, the Club 136 actually came out because of the request of quite a few uh, number of owners uh, that were debating whether to go flying or not. And uh, together with them, we decided that uh, times uh, in our vision were not ready for going uh, uh, in, the, in the flying, uh, but uh, having intelligent uh, use of foils uh, that uh, like the sea foil that is on the 36, which allow you to have uh, some better performance, uh, was uh, a way to familiarize with foils, uh, but not going to the extreme of uh, flying boats. The company Nautil Swan has a very proud history in racing, as many people will know, going back a long way, but it's also very well known for high quality blue water cruising boats. And it's a, it must be a very tricky balance to tread between racing on one hand and blue water cruising on the other. How, and yet you, you continue to succeed. Well, we're keeping the two um, um, divisions are quite separately, Club Swan and Swan. And Swan, uh, of course, is uh, um, the pinnacle of our production. And, it is, and so we're very, very committed all along uh, since my times, which are pretty long at this point. Uh, we have uh, always very committed to the identity and the identity of a swan uh, is made by elements that we'll never compromise on, uh, which is the reliability, first of all, the elegance, the performance, uh, the um, tested innovations, and, uh, and the, the line that is uh, recognizable, it has this identity that makes it uh, a unique product. 
Meanwhile, alongside the owner drivers and amateur crews, there were plenty of rock stars here too, talking exactly the language you'd expect at the end of the penultimate day. One in particular was figuring out how they could snatch the overall lead from Ferragamo and his crew in the club's 150 class. Yeah, look, we're in the hunt uh, heading into tomorrow. We're uh, in second place and Corte Leone leads, uh, but the points are tight, so uh, yeah, we'd love to have a good day tomorrow. Um, if we have a good day, we know we can win, but uh, it's really up to us. We've been making a few mistakes out there and leaving some opportunities open, and uh, if we sail mistake-free, we've got a good chance. The last day of racing delivered a fitting end to an event that had seen some superb sea breeze conditions. So who came out on top? In the Swan 42 class, Pedro Comas delivered another win and a second to take the overall lead, with Massimo de Campos on Selen coming in second overall. Jose Mezeguel took third aboard Pez d'Abril. In the Swan 36s, Hawk and Lorenzen's Mamo almost tripped up with a seventh in the penultimate race, but scored a first in the final one to take the overall victory. Behind them, the competition was very tight, but in the end, Lorenzo Mondo on Fastar finished second and Eduardo Ferragamo on Cor de Leon took third. Keeping the family trophy cabinet stocked up with silverware, Swan boss Leonardo Ferragamo held his nerve on the final day in a very tight battle with Hendrik Brandic's early bird. Going into the penultimate race, the pair were separated by just one point. But while Ferragamo kept cool and took a first and a third to win the class overall, the pressure took its toll aboard Early Bird, who came fourth and seventh to finish second overall. Well, it's very, very emotional, and it was uh, very highly uh, fought for until the very last minute. Uh, uh, after it's incredible in this one design racing, how everything is neck to neck uh, and uh, the boats are very uh, alternating in the winds. Uh, and so after 10 races, uh, we had to wait at the very last uh, uh, few moments uh, to understand that we were going to win. The motion is uh, incredibly high. For me, it's the first uh, world championship in my life. I had tried so many other times and now finally I got it. So I'm really very, very happy and uh, I'm happy I got it with uh, the Club 150. Taking third was Louis Balkan's Balthazar. But whatever the results, as far as the teams were concerned, the standard of competition at the Swan One Design Worlds at a venue that's famous for hosting the 32nd America's Cup had delivered both on and off the water. So in a world that's often dominated by professional racing, it's good to see that the owner-driver formula and a mixture of pro-am crews is alive and well. And to those that worry that the racing world has been taken over by foiling, Valencia delivered the answer. Not yet.